Okay, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. I'm just gonna take a second to welcome everyone here on behalf of the US Embassy. So thanks for coming. Um, we don't have much time and we've got a lot of panelists, great panelists. So I'm just gonna take a second um, again to say thank you for coming and um, really it, we're the, at the Embassy, we're really grateful to have the opportunity to to engage on a topic, the future of education, that's such a priority issue for the US-Irish relationship. And we're really excited to have the opportunity to encourage more forward-leaning activity in this area. So with that, I'll hand it over to your moderator, Angela. Thank you. Thank you, Angie. Um, my name is Angela Rickard. I'm a teacher educator in NUI Maynooth. And the reason I'm on this, um, have this opportunity to speak to you is I, along with nine other people, was part of a um, delegation that went to the United States in January. And our brief was to look at uh, educational technology, um, and it was a bringing together of various different people from different spheres, so uh, teacher educators, policy makers. I'll introduce you to my colleague, um, Anna Walsh, in a moment. Um, but entrepreneurs and other people working in the area of educational technology. And we were, to some extent, the eyes and ears of the US Embassy for two weeks, where we were taken uh, around, I think, uh, five different cities uh, in a two-week period and had something like 27 meetings. Uh, so it was a pretty intensive two-week period, but we learned a great deal. But one of the standout um, occasions of the two weeks was the opportunity to meet uh, co colleagues working in Emerson College uh, where they were um, working on a game-based approach to engaging um, civilian uh, actions and real-world actions, um, civic engagement, I should say, not civilian. But um, so this prompted us to look at, as one of the themes for this project, uh, for this conference, uh, the idea of redefining civic engagement. and inviting a number of other panelists to uh, this um, opportunity to talk about that. And I think if you're here, it's because you're interested in um, civic education or uh, possibly development education or various different um, aspects of education or uh, uh, service education or, or connecting with the community. So um, the task that we have is to introduce the, the panel, ask them to talk about the ways that they've been uh, engaging with technology, the different perspectives and um, angles that they take on it. Um, Anna, I don't know if you want to say some uh, words before we hand over to the panelists, but what uh, I suppose what I want to say is um, this is an opportunity for a conversation more so than uh, a lecture or a speech by anybody, at least of all me. And, uh, but just that you are welcome to uh, contribute and ask questions. We would, would just ask you to let us know who you are and what um, affiliation you have. Thank you. I will uh, just briefly introduce myself before uh, we stand aside and let our friends here do the talking. My name is Anna Walsh and I work with the National Council for Curriculum and Assessment. Uh, my main job, and the reason I was a, a seconded from school, I'm a, I'm a chemistry teacher in a secondary school, I was seconded to uh, work on the development of Leaving Certificate curricula in physics, chemistry and biology, and more recently I'm now working on the new science syllabus for junior cycle, of which you've heard so much about in the news. Now interestingly, as I've been on this journey of curriculum development and uh, seeing how technology impinges on what's going to happen in the future with our learners. We see this great kind of, there has been this tension about uh, what we do in the classroom in terms of strict content, the content of physics, of biology, of chemistry, and how in the future that is actually going to really, their knowledge of, of those subjects is going to impact very much on learners' lives in a way it never did before. Before it was enough to know the fundamental laws and theories. Now we have a real way 
of actually within schools and within the curriculum of increasing this civic engagement by learners understanding through their physics, biology, and chemistry, those public, very public statements about science that are made, and how they as citizens can actually work towards making things better. Uh, just one interesting thing that happened only the other day, um, uh, seismo seismometers in school, something that we, we looked at, and I worked with some teachers about looking at uh, earthquakes in terms of physics, in terms of the waves, the S waves, the P waves, and using that as a cool way of studying waves in physics. Actually, what's happened to those children who have had seismometers in their classrooms is they saw that earthquake the other morning. They Facebooked it. They tweeted it. They actually felt hugely engaged with that tragedy. They didn't really look at the S waves and the P waves, but they felt very strongly that they were part of a community and colleagues their age were suffering really badly in another place in the world, but they were engaged. Now, that has expanded because they also had the seismometers there for the Haitian earthquake, etc., cetera, and, and they've been on the radio a few times. But it's, there, there are so many ways that we don't even realize how the technology and, and the use of technology is actually going to bring the, the, the outside into the classroom, but more importantly, our learners out there to make decisions for themselves about how things are going to be in the future. So I suppose that's my little bit about where I see the, the, the core curriculum, if you like, and the interface that that plays now, much more than it ever did, with human lives and how these learners actually go about their day-to-day -day business. And um, a lot of the stuff that we're going to hear about now is really going to support and facilitate those people to use what they learn and actually move with it. So I'm really looking forward to seeing this. Do you want to introduce? Well, I think, I think we will invite uh, each panelist to introduce themselves because I think that they would do, uh, we would do no better a job. And you can also consult the, uh, the booklet here. Just in the interests of time, I would like to hand over to each panelist uh, themselves and um, just invite you to tell us about the work that you're doing, uh, the various uh, projects that speak to uh, engaging uh, with, um, with the community. Thanks. Um, so my name is Steve Walter. I'm the managing director of the Engagement Game Lab at Emerson College. And um, we, are, we are an applied research lab that designs and studies um, playful systems, games, and technology for civic engagement. Um, and that's specifically what we do, but broadly we're, we're, we're interested in two broad tracks of, of, of thought. The first one is what we call playful civic learning. And it's, um, it's the condition of, we, we, we call it the condition of reflection on civic acts. And so what it really is, um, you know, it's on one hand, it's the application of knowledge in a real civic context, very much uh, in terms of what you were saying, but it's also learning through the civic context, through an actual action. And so it's really cyclical in that way. Um, yes, you're applying things, but you're also learning, experiencing new things, and then reapplying that in the world uh, again. Um, so there's that aspect of things. And, and we see civic, um, civic learning really an intergenerational learning uh, environment. Um, and so many of our projects uh, are based uh, on sort of equal inclusion of both the young and the old um, in the same platform together. And one of the things that we found just um, through that, that basic uh, aspect of the design is that um, you know, adults say that um, when youth are involved in some sort of real world civic process um, based around learning, they change their behavior a bit. They try, try to be models for the youth. And um, in, in the games that are, you know, t are taking the place of, say, a traditional town hall planning meeting, um, adults said that they, they thought about their responses more, they can, the information they contributed to that planning process was more nuanced, they tried to be more civil, um, more grammatically correct. And at the same time, the youth said that the presence of adults on that platform um, changed how they engaged. Uh, they were in the process of almost, the process of sort of performing as adults and having adults on the same process in which they're learning and taking action um, legitimized it for themselves, and they, they put, um, put more serious thought into things. And so the other aspect of things, in addition to the, sort of this playful civic learning idea, is, is thinking about the kinds of civic technologies that are out there. 
Um, and so most of the technology and most of the rhetoric that we see around technology for civic engagement or the smarter city and things like that um, is about increasing this idea of efficiency. It's about going from point A to point B as fast as possible, as cost efficient as possible, um, and without any other sort of messiness involved. And it's really important, uh, especially nowadays when governments around the world are really trying to keep up to the trends that people, um, that regular citizens have in terms of how they engage with each other. Um, but it's not the whole story for a, a pluralistic democratic system. Um, we believe that uh, in addition to having efficiencies, um, there are things that we call meaningful inefficiencies that are crucial to that. And what a meaningful inefficiency is, is essentially a, a sort of an event or something that doesn't take place um, in the sort of normal stream of life. And it's a way for people to come together, deliberate about issues in a playful, maybe chaotic, slightly messy and unpredictable way, but in a way that hopefully leads to a, a type of learning, a deeper learning that one couldn't normally have done otherwise in the sort of fast paced, you know, going from A to B sort of lifestyle of um, any sort of civic process that, that's occurring these days. And so one of the, um, one of the, new modalities that we're experimenting with uh, in terms of creating a context of both um, playful civic learning and a, a meaningful inefficiency um, is this concept of uh, engagement games. And an engagement game is uh, when the game itself is the actual real world civic process. And when acts of play within the game are real world acts. So it's not just a game for fun and it's not just a game for learning. Um, and of course, there are many games for learning out there that take place both in the classroom and outside of it, and this concept builds upon that. But it combines the affordances of those sorts of learning games with the affordances of modern internet network connected technologies that could facilitate some sort of real world social action or change. Um, and so that's, that's you know, basically what an engagement game is and does. Um, some examples of engagement games include um, one of our games called Community Planet, um, which is a game for um, local community planning. Um, so essentially the game um, is a new form of a sort of town hall, uh, town hall meeting. Uh, it's not meant to replace that because those things are important and it's just one modality in, in a sort of civic process that, um, that you know, we, uh, we advocate for in addition to traditional offline things that are happening. Um, and that sort of multimodal approach we believe is the most effective. But what it essentially does is uh, it creates a, a learning environment around an environment where real world action can happen. And so a typical, a typical community planet game usually lasts around three weeks. It's, it's an event, it takes place during a short period of time. And it's about, it's bringing people together, um, young and old from various races, um, stake, stake hold, um, stakes and positions in the community um, to deliberate around um, a planning process. Um, we've done it for master planning processes, such as um, in the city of Detroit. It was um, we did a game around there, a 50-year master planning process, and um, or like more specific things such as social media policy in schools, um, to uh, more scientific issues like uh, planning for climate change in a region. And every game is tied to something uh, official. So at the end of the game, the data that people generate through playing actually leads, is analyzed and leads to some sort of policy change or published report or planning document. And in addition to that, um, because those goals and those incentives are sort of long range usually, um, and it's tough to sort of paint the picture of how your voice in the system can lead to something direct, um, there's, um, there's a, a particular part of the game that we call causes, which um, are essentially, um, it's sort of like a, fun, a kickstarter for, um, for, for civic projects. And any player who plays the game can submit their own cause. And that can range from uh, cleaning up a park to um, raising money to bring technology to a classroom. And as people play the game, and the more that they contribute in the game to the larger issues, the larger planning process, um, you get more influence. And you can um, transfer that influence to voting on these causes. And at the end of the game, the top three causes each win real world funding. So the game aims to both create the sort of long-term collective action of planning and changing policy for the future, but also um, enabling individual and smaller collective action on a, in a very direct way, uh, there's real world funding. Um, so that's just an example. Um, we've done other projects in Zambia um, with the International Red Cross that aims to um, help teach people about um, uh, 
the flooding um, of the Zambezi River. Um, again, it's intergenerational for young and old. And in addition to learning about it, the real world outcome is um, through the play of the game, which takes place over SMS-based cell phone, an actual communication network is set up between the people upstream and the people downstream so that in the event of a real flood, you actually have contacts that you, uh, upstream who can warn the people downstream of what's about to happen. So um, there's a lot more I can say, but I don't want to take up too much more time. Um, that's generally what we do, and I welcome you, or whoever else wants to go. Do you have a running order? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to jump the feet. I think we're going to keep this very informal and just uh, invite you as, you as you're sitting. So, Elizabeth, if, if okay. I could invite you sure. uh, next. I and uh, thank you, Steve, for, uh, and, and as you wish, I think you have a microphone. I do. I think if I come to the podium, no disrespect, but I'll create an audio feedback loop. It will give you all a headache, so I'll stay here if everyone um, can hear. So my name is Elizabeth Goodman. Um, I'm the Chair of Creative Technology Innovation at UCD and Professor of Inclusive Design for Learning in the School of Education, and I also direct the Smart Lab, which I set up 24 years ago at the BBC um, and brought with me to Ireland. And a brand new initiative, which is, I think, really exciting for, for Ireland and internationally, which is called the Inclusive Design Research Centre of Ireland at UCD, and it includes partners from, from all of the universities north and south, and what that one is about is the co-design of our learning spaces, learning environments, and social environments with um, the broadest range of our communities, including elderly citizens, people with intellectual disabilities, um, uh, abused women, etc. So it's an inclusive design model of society applied to um, a research center that is action oriented. Um, and before coming here, I was also the director of research for Future Lab, which is David Putnam's um, think tank for the future of education. So I can talk about any of those things if you like, but I thought I'd talk about something else, if that's okay, just following on from, um, from this, because it's been a fascinating day and a really rich range of speakers. Um, but a few, there are just a few observations I'd make, um, and then I can talk about any project anyone's interested in. Um, one was this, this notion of going from A to B and that kind of experiential learning. And recently, um, I was uh, co-facilitating the, the second climate gathering in Dublin um, with Martin Curley from Intel. So Martin's um, take, um, quite rightly, from the industry perspective was, uh, if, as he says, uh, if you want to stop people going from A to B, either in climate change initiatives or any other educational experiential um, learning process, if you want to stop people going from A to B, you have to create the possibility of C. And that that's, that's what we need to do first, I think, in the educational environment. But they brought me in to work with Martin, and, and it was fascinating, continues to be now, another work we're doing, because they brought me in to speak for the women. Because in the first climate gathering out in Burham, at the end of that gathering, which had Obama's climate advisor and, and all amazing high-level people from around the world, the women had almost self-formed a group to talk about myth and the women's militia and the kinds of peaceful um, messaging that needed to come forward in that particular area of climate change debate because the perception, not only from the women, but mainly from the women gathered there, was that the, the scary science stories about um, how quickly the ice caps are going to melt and, and how rapidly we're going to lose the things that we care about were just so scary that people were turning off and they wanted a different kind of messaging drawing upon myth. So we came up with in that first gathering and then we came back to it in the second and now we're creating some games and social projects around it, um, including a real one I'll tell you about very briefly. But anyway, what we came up with was the story of the next, next generation. So that it's a similar metaphor, but it's just talking about, so the late Steve Jobs said, um, you know, famously said that if, if you wanted to create a, a prototype for whatever gadget, the iPhone or whatever, he would only accept that prototype if the engineers and design teams had thought two generations out. So they had to already know that there would be interoperability and community take up, buy in, et cetera, two iterations forward. And so the women of the climate gathering said, let's think about the next, next generation. We are the carriers, not the only carriers, but some of the main carriers of concern for human values for the next, next generation of children. Let's design the world we want them to live in using that iterative design model from Apple. So we've been doing that, and at the moment we're, we're trying to build an observatory in Cahir Daniel and Kerry around the knowledge of those people for the next next generation who are being lost. Um, but some of this is developing as game design. And I used to run the Magic Game Lab in London, which had the first Fab Lab in London and blah, blah, blah. All that kind of stuff came together. But, but the really interesting thing about those spaces, and we need a bigger one, I think, here in Dublin, is that um, uh, the kind of work that we're now trying to do out in Cahir Daniel and that we're doing in, in 
um, in Africa through, through the Horizon Near Program, et cetera. All of this work, it needs shared spaces which are free and accessible to all, which are wheelchair accessible, where everyone is welcome, where it's safe for everyone to arrive in the dark and to get home in the dark, and where we have this kind of buddy system social model whereby someone who's physically mobile and someone who's um, got uh, what tend to be called disabilities in the modern world, but which are very rich skill sets, like people with Asperger's, have really rich skill sets, which some industry are now um, selecting out deliberately as skill sets, those people, as in our PhD program, can be matched very effectively with people with different social skills and different physical abilities and from different disciplines. And together, you can co-design all of the tools we need for the next next generation. But without all those people in the room, we cannot. So um, anyway, I could go on all day. What, what I was going to say just briefly, though, is that what we had in the Magic Lab, the Multimedia and Games Innovation Center in Dublin, sorry, in London, we were based in the Docklands, so we were right across from City Airport. It was fully accessible. We just designed the space in the way that we heard in previous sessions about the classroom of the future. Everything could be broken down very quickly. It was all very light. Everything was on wheels. Everything was wired from above. The kitchen facilitated all forms of disability access. There were, we could get people to and from. There was a fab lab, and there was a game lab, and, and there were all kinds of things going on. But everyone was welcome, so the Bengali women's group could make objects to sell to make money to send to their families back home. The kids from the Stephen Hawking School could come in and redesign their classrooms using the technology with support. The guys who called themselves the geezers down the road who were the, the guys from the Docklands who had the old boats who couldn't fix them anymore because the parts don't exist could come in and make the parts. And then these guys would talk to each other. And with the PhD students who were NASA scientists and game designers from Disney, and you know all these people who had other kinds of skills but who needed the experience of this community. So I guess what I'm loving for and following on from these examples is we kind of know that the shared experience model is needed when we know that the space has to be afforded for that and it's got to be free and open source and open literally to all. And um, I guess that's what I'm lobbying for in Dublin at the moment because I think if we had it, we'd be building some of the models for future education instead of talking about them um, because we could do it together and everyone's views would be included. I'll stop. And I'm, I'm not going to give people an opportunity to interact with you individually until we've heard from everybody. Um, so I'm going to hand over to James Corbett. Um, and um, I'm certain that there are resonances with uh, some of what Elizabeth has been saying. With yeah. Your yeah, for sure. Um, hi, everyone. My name is James, James Corbett. Um, I'm the founder of a company called Mission V. And we are building a, a platform for teaching um, through virtual reality. Um, I would have been kind of nervous about saying that maybe until last week when a, a young man called Mark Zuckerberg uh, spent two billion on a company called Oculus, uh, which is developing a virtual reality headset. And we've had one in, in, in the lab, which is really an office, it, for the last six months. And it's an amazing, it's an amazing device. So I'm not going to emphasize too much the technology side of things today, but um, I suppose it's just, it, just to keep an open mind about this virtual reality space now, because it is one of those things that until such time as you put on this headset, you can't imagine really what it's like. It really does transform or transfer you into um, another reality. Um, and there is a real kind of a, a psychological effect associated, associated with that. So we used to say, up to that that we were building virtual worlds and not a lot of people got what virtual worlds were either but then along came something called Minecraft and everyone got it all of a sudden because uh, as you know with Minecraft the, the game is something that starts off being very popular but most kids kind of forget about the game side of it after a while and, and use uh, Minecraft as an open learning space and it's in that creativity in building their own um, learning environments that, that, that uh, the value of a virtual world like Minecraft and the kind of system that we use is. So just to wind back a bit, we were actually a not-for-profit two years ago. Um, I actually started, I was doing IT support in a local Gwail school about five years ago. And I remember the principal there, Dahi Omoruku, um, used to say to me, look, we have all, it was a brand new school, we had great broadband, we had laptops, um, whiteboards in every room, um, interactive whiteboards, and he said, you know, 
James, we're, we're, we've got all this technology, but we're not teaching really any better or any differently to the way we've always taught. In, in, in other words, the, the pedagogy hasn't changed or adapted. And he, he was just wondering for someone like me with an IT background, did I, did I have any ideas around that? And, and I guess I was just kind of vaguely aware about the emerging um, pedagogy of game-based learning at that stage. Um, and I suppose it seemed like game-based learning was being adopted in two different ways. Uh, and the main way was that um, learning games were being taken off the shelf in a kind of a piecemeal fashion to teach different uh, aspects of the curriculum. But we thought there was better value in providing an open-ended platform, a virtual world platform, to the teachers and the students themselves so that they could create their own learning games. Uh, and that's what we did. We used an off-the-shelf uh, open source system called Open Simulator, so we weren't um, tying them into a commercial product. And it was really, it was, it, it was amazing to see the reaction in the classroom from the students and from the teachers in the way that they engaged um, in, in not just playing learning games, but in creating their own learning experiences. Um, so at, at that stage, you know, we realized there was something special about it. I went to a, an association called Social Entrepreneurs Ireland, and they gave us some funding to see if we could go further with this idea beyond the one school. Um, and we were looking at the Department of Education um, supported us then through the NCT to run a 20 school uh, program at that stage in game-based learning. And you know, it went really well, I have to say. It was in 14 different counties. Um, there's, you can check out the website, missionv.ie. You'll see there's really great feedback from the teachers. Dr. Conor Galvin at UCD, uh, School of Education and Lifelong Learning did an, an independent evaluation of it, and, and again, he just said it really worked um, extremely well. So unfortunately for us, the, uh, it was the NCT that funded that at the time, and uh, the, the, the NCT, as you know, kind of got dissolved effectively to a degree uh, after that, so uh, we didn't have follow-up funding um, uh, to run, uh, even though we had 60, 60 schools lined up to, to, to participate in year two of the program. So that was when we decided to, uh, to wind down the not-for-profit and we're rebooting at the moment as a for-profit company. But just to, I suppose, just to uh, emphasize one of the other interesting things that happened was we got some funding from uh, Discover Science and Engineering to run a virtual science week. So as you know, they do science week every year and the theme that year was the chemistry of life. Uh, so we had the 20 schools individually created their own science projects in, in, in the game environment. And then on uh, the week itself, Science Week itself, they all effectively teleported in, if you've seen Star Trek, into the one uh, shared environment. And it was like a, a young scientist, a virtual young scientist exhibition where they got to roam around and see the, the projects that the other students from the other schools had developed and to, to, to engage with them. And that was an incredible learning experience. It was so eye-opening for them to, to see the work that the others had done, to, to be able to share their work and just explain it to the other kids. It took a real sense of pride in that. Um, so that, that was just a really interesting um, dynamic. And I guess I'm rambling on a bit at this stage, so I'll pass it on over to, 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 to Fred. Don't worry. Um, and again, I would just um, move swiftly along to uh, Fred Boss, who was a mention there of, of NCTE, and, uh, and there's a, a connection there. But um, Fred, we'll head, uh, hand over to you. Yeah, my name is Fred Boss. I was with NCT, which became PDST Technology and Education, now I'm with NCCA, so I'm collecting as many letters as I can <laughs> you know, as I go along. Hopefully one of them might be a PhD at the end, but I somehow <laughs> doubt it severely. I have everything written down to remind me what to say, because there's more holes in my head than there is in a tea bag. Um, the first thing I want to say is that we're doing a lot of talking today about technology and how it works. The one thing I see about technology is it democratizes things. It makes information open, it makes everything as open as possible. Once you can get your hands on a device, you're in there. And the main thing about that is, and it's been mentioned by a few people here today, is that it also increases engagement. And what follows along with engagement is ownership. And once you get engagement and ownership in a civics project, in a game, whatever, you get people on board. And that's the main and the most important thing. Just to come back to what I'm doing at the moment with the NCCA, like Anna, I'm on the junior cycle team, so I'm working at Myself, I'm kind of babysitting the coding short courses coming out at the moment, fingers crossed, after tomorrow. I do a lot of sneak previews today because I can never kind of stop rambling. Sorry about that. Um, also, at junior cycle level, I can't speak for primary too much due to the fact that 
another primary teacher and post-primary. At junior cycle level at the moment, there is a CSP, a civics course. Now that's been turned into a short course at the moment as well. So hopefully to engage more students in the actual kind of side of civics. It's also been upped from being a 70 hour course to a 100 hour course. So it's actually, even though it's no longer called a subject of short courses, it is actually being upped now in the amount of time students have to engage. And again, engagement is very important for them and ownership of what they're going to do as they develop their projects as they work along would be very important. Also on the NCCA website, there's the new Leaving Cert course. Now I say new, I saw a date on it just yesterday and I was looking back at it, it said 2011, but I suppose it's new because it's not out yet. That's out there at the moment, if you want to have a read of that, feel free. Um, the main thing about that and the junior cycle stuff is it's all about active citizenship and reflective citizenship. So again, you're trying to engage people, you're trying to get them to think about why they're doing things and why would they be bothered doing it and if they're interested then obviously you're dealing in ownership from then on. And once you have ownership, you have a buy-in. Once you have a buy-in, the more engaged, the more into exactly what it is they're doing. After Easter this year, there's a thing called Digital Art Week that myself and two primary teachers work on. Now, I do this kind of part-time just for the fun of it because I'm an art teacher at post-primary level. And what it is is we get primary schools to go onto social media to engage as much as they can with each other and the idea of art in primary schools. I know nothing about art in primary schools. If it's not Leonardo da Vinci and I'm not teaching it in art history, you know, it's maybe not what I want, or <coughs> colouring inside or outside lines. I don't really care about that whatsoever, because to me, art is art is art. So when it comes to Twitter Art Week, what I do is I use social media to engage the schools. So I disguise myself as a completely different social media account called Leo da V. Strange coincidence there. That's a vole. It's a little cartoon character. And he sends out quizzes and questions to the schools. And they go to a website, they try to find all the answers, and they send them back the an or their answers. And if they're right, they get a puzzle piece or a prize. And if they're wrong, he says, oh, no, you've got to try again. And the puzzle piece eventually, over the week, they all add up. They put it together. It's some kind of a famous painting. And they have to try and come back to win their certificate at the end by saying what the painting is and talking a little bit about it. About two years ago, what I did was I actually ran two accounts side by side, so I had a bad guy coming in to steal all the paintings. And they had to stop it by identifying the paintings ahead of the bad guy stealing it. So they had 24 hours to do all this. Of course, me being me, I mixed up all the accounts from time to time. I was responding to people as the bad guy, as the good guy, as myself. It was kind of strange like that. Um, what Steve was saying there earlier about, was it the community game you have? Yeah. That's the 2.0 version of something I worked with, with the EU a few years ago, and around the turn of the century, if you can remember that far back. What it was, was we decided to invent a role-playing game to better explain how the EU decision-making processes work. So when something gets turned into a law, this is how it gets turned into a law. So what happened is we came up with the idea that in every country, we'd pick one school. Now, as many schools could sign up for this as possible, we'd divvy them out. One school would decide to become the EU Commission and come up with the great idea. One school would be the Parliament, they'd argue for and against it. And one school would be the Council of Ministers, who would also argue for and against and decide this doesn't suit our country, we're voting against it. But what would happen is, after a week, everything swapped and everybody else got their turn to be the Council or the Commission or the Parliament and come up with what they thought was their big idea. It didn't have to be based on what anyone else has because there's different laws going through at different times. After another week, it would swap again. So all three schools were involved together as much as possible in the process. Unfortunately, it being web 0.01, we did it through email through the teachers rather than through the students. We didn't do Skype. We didn't have anything fancy whatsoever. So when people are saying, which they have at some talks today, Skype is going to be just, our kids are going to laugh at us that we use Skype. I'm sure people are laughing now that we used email and just through teachers only. Because so this is how things are advancing at the moment. One last thing when it comes to engagement, what I do is I moderate an online chat on Monday nights from half eight to half nine called Ed Chat IE, based on the American Ed Chat model. The IE is the Irish denominator there. And what happens is teachers suggest um, a topic to talk about. They vote on the topic they want to talk about. Sorry, teachers, educators, I got given out to that. When I was setting up first, third level wanted to get on board. We can't call them teachers, they're educators. Like, that'll sum us all up, so that's fine. What they do is suggest the topics, they vote on the topics, they argue about the topics, whatever. Then on the Monday night, the topic that's chosen is the one that's debated for an hour. 
And what you see here is a different type of engagement. They're not in the staff room anymore. They don't have the principal or the geography teachers as their enemies. You know, they're actually engaging. And some of them are very strong. Some of them are troublemakers. They do it on purpose. They ask the dodgy questions and twist the knife a little bit. But it keeps the conversation going and everyone is on good terms because they know it's a social media thing. Once they put it out there, it is public. And they also know that what I do at the end of the chat is to pull the transcript together and publish it out on the EdChat IE wiki. So we've 125 chats, number 126 is happening this Monday. So I think that's more than enough rambling for me. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. And um, we didn't tell you that the person sitting beside you is a geography teacher. <laughs> the enemy. The no, I, read, I read the bio. Maybe I said it on purpose. <laughs> so, Sean, um, you're very welcome to uh, tell us about the work that you've been doing. Yeah, I'll do the ladybird version because we're caught for time. Uh, I'm a second level school teacher. For the last five years, I've been working in the School of Education in NUI Galway, uh, working with training teachers. Um, just to give a tiny little bit of background to the project I'm involved in, uh, I work with an Irish medium program, so it prepares second level teachers to teach in Irish medium schools. Um, and I was brought in because I had been building resources to teach, um, we'll say maths, teach science through Irish. It was all PC based. I was brought in and after two years of the program, 70% of our cooperating schools were using iPads, so my skills were were null and void. And a lot of our teachers that were going out to these schools didn't have the skills. So I, I ended up having to get trained up. I became an Apple Professional <laughs> Development uh, Certified. And uh, basically, we, we brought in a module. Or we brought in a model where all of our student teachers would come in with iPads, and we run most of our, most of our course through the iPad or through, through the device. Uh, as part of that work, because I'm now qualified to, to give professional development to, to schools, I was asked to be involved with a program or a project called the School in a Box. Uh, the School in the Box isn't a NUI Galway project. It's, it was designed here in IADT. Uh, and what it is essentially is a flight case. And in this flight case, there is one iPad. There are the cables that you would need. There is also a, a projector. And they all run on solar panels. So the, the idea is that if you go to a traditional, or our, we'll say our, um, stereotypical school in the third in a developing country where they've no electricity, where they've huge classes, where we might have something like this room here, but you know, 100 people in it with no pencils, no pens, no, no copy books. How do, you, how do you teach them teachers? Uh, my background is, was in ed tech, it was in social geography. So to get the chance to go to West Africa to use um, you know, development education and technology in the one project was, was a dream. Uh, I was asked to go to Burkina Faso which is in West Africa. 80% um, of the population of Burkina Faso are rural, and 70% of that population have no electricity. So it'll give you an idea of the kind of difficulties facing teachers. 30% uh, of the population, of the school-going population, would have no resources whatsoever. Uh, so I went to Burkina Faso with the skills that I had with, with training teachers in Ireland to see if they were transferable. Uh, there was a group of 20 teachers, they all received an iPad, and they got a week's training with myself uh, to create their own content. So instead of giving them old computers, or instead of giving them books, or instead of giving them content that wasn't Burkina Faso specific, uh, we were training them in how to put their own content together, and it was phenomenal. Within six days, we had 11 curricular uh, syllabus covered from, from start to finish. Uh, one of the projects was, was run with science teachers. Um, and what we did was, and if you think about it, they, there was no science lab in these schools. The science teachers, most of them had PhDs and, uh, ma or masters. They were teaching the theory of science without ever having the opportunity to have any practical demonstration whatsoever. So with the iPad, we went to the local university. We videoed, uh, I think it was 12 or 14 science experiments. They, with the iPad, they edited them on the iPad, voiced over them on the iPad, built iBooks with all the content, just copied and pasted stuff, Wikipedia and whatever else they could find, but they had their localized uh, Burkina Faso videos as part of it. Um, later on in that week, on the final day, we got to um, test them in some of the schools, which was phenomenal. So you went in with your solar-paneled iPad, your solar-paneled projector, 
you know, into a classroom of 200 people projected on a wall, and you had everyone experience, experiencing physics, you know, we were talking about physics, physics experiments that, you know, the teacher had seen in university, but no student had ever experienced. Um, when the bell rang, nobody left the room. You know, they wanted more and more and more. Students didn't go out to play. Um, and that's, you know, if you want to see how technology can enhance learning, it was a, it was a brilliant case study. Uh, the most interesting thing for me was the content that was built in six days with, you know, with committed teachers that just wanted to be there to learn was phenomenal. And it was absolutely at the same standard as the student teachers that me and Angela babysit and spoon feed uh, for a living here in teacher education programs in, in, in Ireland. Um, and as I say, it's not an NUI Galway project, it's an IADT project here in, in Dublin. But it's a good idea, it's a good sample of how, how, how technology can, can enhance learning, especially in, in developing countries. There is one other thing I want to share with you. Uh, earlier on, we all watched a, a video, and I felt robbed watching the video that um, Microsoft, was it Microsoft? They were showing, and it was an absolutely excellent class of, of uh, using Skype. Um, eight years ago, I did the exact same thing in Ireland, <laughs> teaching in a school in South Connemara for the Irish Orals, where they were worried they wouldn't understand people from Kerry, if the kicker was from Kerry or Donegal, and we did eye chat between students in Donegal, Kerry, and Galway, where they all asked each other the questions and had mock, mock orals, and all we did was faci you know, facilitate. So I feel gutted that. <laughs> <laughs> if I just got there a week before. You didn't have to guess if they were from Kerry. Or no, no, you didn't have to guess. It, was, it gave it away. So I might leave it at that, because I know there's well, the I question time. And I really would share a lot of the vision and of the innovative uh, ideas that were presented this evening. But one of the things I, that strikes me as one of the schools who's belonging to the network and introducing and enjoying introducing, and I can say that on behalf of my staff, the junior, the JCSA, we can even pronounce those letters without having to think about them. But one of the things that strikes me when we're engaging in conversation with other schools who may not be as lucky to be in with the network is the whole obsession around assessment. We have a whole entire country, grannies, um, aunts, uncles. If you talk to a 14 or 15 year old, they'll immediately say you're doing your junior cert and they go into a whole little conversation there about study and all that. So what I'm just wondering is in those, for somebody in the panelist, mid panel to talk about how I think assessment as we know it today is exceptionally restrictive in trying, for me personally, I look at it and I say it restricts our vision and our enthusiasm. I can safely say, having introduced some of the technology, we can, of course, gripe about we need more and more money, et cetera, to support <laughs> these innovative ideas, that I can see assessment in the correct vision that the NCCA sets out, uh, really engaging the students and enhancing the teaching learning experience. But I just wondered if somebody would comment on the assessment of struck with Africa, for example, did they have the Owl Even cert to do? You know, or you know what I mean? You know that kind of pressure that a teacher gets themselves obsessed about, as opposed to saying, actually, if you do all this, you'll actually enhance the achievements of the students. <laughs> um, I suppose the one thing that comes to mind is the experience I had a few weeks ago. I have a daughter doing the junior cert and I have a son doing the leaving cert. And I would come home from work in the office and I'd get in fairly late because the bus is usually very slow. 
and I'd be sitting at home and I'd hear pacing upstairs and they'd be learning off by heart everything they needed to know for whatever exam it was, they had to go in and sit for the mocks, you know, which is a big thing. And my wife was looking at me and I'm looking at her and she's kind of saying, and this is going to change when? And I said, <laughs> we're working on it, we're working on it. <laughs> but the thing about assessment is, it's an end at the moment. The junior cert is the end. The second they step foot into transition year or fifth year, nobody wants to talk to the junior cert anymore. It's the leaving cert. And that's the next end. So it's not, it's not the student that's being looked at, it's the assessment. And it's, that's what everyone is going by and that's what everyone is judging things by. At the moment, we have kind of an exciting project happening in the NCCA. I'm well, sorry, not in it, but we're part of it. It's a kind of a worldwide organization that we're part of called Collaborative um, Assessment. And what happens is it's where students who don't, have never met, don't know each other. They do this in Australia as well at the moment. They actually get onto a computer and they have to work out a problem between them. And each of them have half of the problem. Myself and a colleague tried this out. You have half a problem each and you have to talk, you have to collaborate. And all the while this is going on, now I haven't seen the metrics in the background, and that's the one thing, the analytics I'd love to see, but it's being recorded. So what you're talking about there is the possibility of real-time assistance, which would happen, like if I get stuck, I'll go into the office next door and I'll say, Anna, this isn't working, can you fix it? Or she'll come in to me and say, this isn't working, can you fix it? You know, so, and that's what happens in the real world. So this whole idea of collaboration, this whole idea of Know, coming back to getting the student kind of involved and actually seeing not just what they know but how they know it and how they can figure out from what they know where to go next or can they bring someone in to help them which is what people do in every day anyway like at the moment I think we're just kind of measuring the what they know bit the how they know it the why they know it the what the hell are you going to do with it afterwards that's so much more open so much bigger probably not as easy to um, assess that's probably just the way it is at the moment I can jump in. I mean, I did a lot of work uh, previously on assessment models and the, the desire to shift assessment models so that we could have a longitudinal view of education where we could track learner choice, including um, empathy and emotional um, intelligence as opposed to just literacy and numeracy. And, and we were building a tool with Microsoft and the OECD, um, and, and we may one day finish that. But, but what we came up against again and again even though there were schools, the Lumiar schools in Brazil, and you know whole systems using the methods, and we were working with real groups, etc., again and again in England, anyway, and this, uh, we stopped that four years ago when I came here. Um, you come up against the assessment model that it's all well and good to have charter schools that are working and project-based learning and all the rest of it, and the kids can be um, working together in different age groups and flying. Everyone can see that they're flying, and you could be tracking their learning choices and seeing that they're becoming more independent and collaborative, and all of that is all well and good. And then someone says, "We can't prove that they can get into university um, unless they can follow this exam." And when I was a kid in New York, certainly. School was so expensive. We all went on TV when we were two, just to, just to have money in the bank. And I was paying off my undergrad loan 10 years after my PhD, many years later. So, so when the pressure is financial like that as well in communities, and it's different in different communities in many ways, um, that pressure is so enormous that you can be as creative as you want in the learning process, and you can track and provide tools um, to make learning more creative and collaborative. And then you're forced into this, this one size fits all assessment system, which just doesn't work. And in, in the work I'm doing in Brussels at the moment, or internationally through the Horizon program, it's one of the biggest challenges. And we are trying to face it. We have to, because we can't move forward in longitudinal studies of educational success in any domain, technologized or not, if we can't break that block that no one can do longitudinal studies because governments change, funding streams change, so you can't do anything consistently for more than four years. And four years isn't long enough to prove that you can, you can deliver to any assessment metric. So, um, so we need to change it. <laughs> um, Malcolm Byrne is my name. I work with the Higher Education Authority. It, it's following on from a point Fred made, and it's about the democratization uh, issue. Uh, Karl Marx famously said that the revolution would come when the tools of production were put into the hands of the proletariat. And that's essentially what technology has allowed to happen. And I've, I have two questions that, that follow on from that. One, uh, how do you reassure educators who are terrified because the learners actually 
know how to use the technology far more effectively to get the information. And, and that, I think, is, is, is one of the big challenges right through the education system. And then the second uh, question, um, in the smart economy of today and the future, are we more powerful as consumers than as citizens? Um, very briefly, uh, one, uh, uh, Antonio Gramsci, writing after Karl Marx, talks about education being the, the sort of the class consciousness or raising thing, um, bringing education. Um, he called the people citizen philosophers, um, which is interesting. Um, but your second, um, your second point about consumers versus citizens, I think, is really important. And it you know, goes back to the point I was trying to make earlier where so much of the technology that we have today uh, involved in smarter cities or you know, civic realms and even education too um, is about efficiency. And it's, it's, it's the most of the technology and the rhetoric around it is just very neoliberal um, in, and very much about um, this concept that uh, Michel Foucault talks about, um, governmentality. And it's, uh, uh, which is essentially, you know, the, instead of, uh, you know, people in power, and not, I'm not really talking about governments, but you know, say corporations, uh, people who want to um, consolidate their power, instead of coercing people into doing things, um, you sort of uh, train them using the technologies you provide to continue to use that technology you provide. Um, and so, and there's another quote that people say, um, the uh, sheep doesn't need a shepherd, but a shepherd needs the sheep. And uh, I think uh, what we see the neoliberal influence in, in technology everywhere you look, and that's one thing we're trying to sort of, um, that we at the lab are trying to combat against. Um, creating technology that can lead to unpredictability, um, not just prescribed actions that some corporation or even government entity is trying to get users to take. Um, and then just real quick, um, that's also the difference between what a lot of people talk about in terms of gamification. Um, versus a, a more uh, um, sort of gameful design approach, and you sort of uh, mentioned this, where gamification is throwing game mechanics and selfish incentives onto something, bells and whistles, to really create behavior change, to get people to do what you want them to do more efficiently. And that's a story with technology beyond, you know, before gamification, but now it's really consolidated in that. And we, we really care about um, making games and making any kind of playful systems that can allow uh, unpredictable action or allow people to take, take their own paths. Um, as opposed to doing some, taking some path that someone lent to them. I can follow on really briefly from that to say, um, I, you know, it's a commonplace, but it is true that people will use any tool that you give them for what they need it for, not what you intended, and um, uh, and that's where this this kind of synchronicity and common sense takes over. So, you know, classic bad examples. Um, some would argue with me, but I would say the, the $100 laptop, but also prior to that, the, the first fab labs, which while they were a fantastic idea and now make sense in, in a more democratized technology society, the first ones were shipped out in boxes to India and they sat in closets because no one, no one knew how to set them up and no one knew what they were for and the, the instructions were not translated into any local dialect, so they just sat in closets, but they were, um, they were the social good or CSR deliverable for big, um, USA funded government projects. So they had to go out, but, but there wasn't any kind of social takeout. And the contrary to that would be a, a counter example. Many years ago, complicated story, but through the BBC, we were um, delivering interactive technology training to, to universities and schools in Africa. Mm -hmm. And we ended up meeting, hypothetically over time, and just coincidentally, a lot of women leaders who hadn't had a chance to use technology. So we set up all women's teaching labs in Morocco in particular. Then, because their kids were coming with them, we just gave them lots of digital cameras to keep them busy, really. And then we set up some games that they could play with digital cameras and showed them how to use them. Then we gave them some free software, which was an early version of iMovie we'd made at the BBC, just, just so that the kids could make their own stories so that their moms could learn about this other technology, etc. A year later, I started receiving um, amazing and very upsetting stories in visual form from both the, the women and the children, which were horrific stories of abuse, which would never have been spoken and would not have been written down even if, if everyone was literate, and which didn't need to be translated because they were visual, though there were often stories attached. And that allowed us to set up a charity called Safety Net, which still runs, thanks to the Fulbright Foundation, et cetera, it still runs and creates safety tools for women and children around the world. But 
we had no intention of that being what happened. And from there, we created um, wearable technologies that could tell you if you were being followed or if your child was being taken over border without your permission, et cetera, et cetera. And now those women, from the early version of those programs, they now lead um, technology centers right across Africa. But none of that was intended. We just wanted the women leaders to learn about technology and then do what they wanted. But you give anybody a tool, and they'll make of it what they want. So I'm always in two minds with this argument that you shouldn't just give people tech, because my four-year-old does amazing things with my iPhone that I didn't know were possible. And if you're willing to learn from the four-year-old or your kids in the classroom, it is quite amazing. But if you're selling for profit or you're imposing only one brand's um, hardware or software, that's, so that's why I would believe in the open, responsible innovation. Everybody's stuff is for free. See what people use it for, and then see if we can come together as a community to support further development. Yeah, just one small comment in terms of the re reassurance to the teachers. Uh, we had one training day on, on the program for the 20 schools, and there was a certain amount of fear that that, that wouldn't be enough. Um, but what we noticed in the course of the year was that the, the, the schools and the teachers that did best were the ones that kind of had the, the right, I'll call it the right attitude, the attitude that, that they were really going to be the facilitator. And they didn't mind the fact that, that in no time at all, the students themselves would probably know more um, in how to use this virtual world environment, but they were happy to facilitate that learning process. Thanks. Uh, just many questions towards uh, the, the lady on the panel. I, f I forget your name, sorry. Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth right. Um, right. So I've been kind of involved with some sort of social spaces in, in the city, which were sort of aspiring towards what you seem to have had going in London. But what we're finding is that the city authorities haven't been uh, dealing properly with them. Yeah. Um, it, there's various kind of spectrum, like different, various ways like uh, that they deal with them, but basically not really in a good way. Like there's... Um, um, so so I'm, I, I guess I was just wondering, like, do you have any, um, like, how can social spaces um, like this, like, how can we find a language, a, or even gone beyond language? Like, sometimes we find that the city authorities will support, so when they kind of understand what you're about, like, whatever multi-purpose, open source, cultural, whatever things, yeah. um, they'll say it in language, but they'll also, like, pull away funding or put up the, <laughs> like, regulatory compliance on this, that, and the other. So it's kind of difficult, like, so... I don't know like, if you have any thoughts on that. And actually, just one quick question to yourself, Steve, like just um, is the thing you're working on, is that going to be open source? I guess that's, or is it open to, to be used? Uh, that's, that's it, thanks. Uh, yeah, real quick. All, of our tech, all the technology we make is open source, although um, uh, it, is, it is hard sometimes to use technology or to understand how to use it effectively, although you're totally mm -hmm. right, and people will take it and do whatever they want with it. So um, the only capacity issue with the stuff we do is just, uh, like uh, understanding, you know, having some um, partnership with us in terms of like actually rolling it out in the most effective way. But yeah, it's open source. <laughs> exactly. And um, I've I've heard of these troubles around Dublin, and um, and I can say from the university side, uh, you know, we were always able to do these things before in New York and and Oxford and Cambridge and London because the university structures there, though limiting in certain ways allowed for the insurance, and often it does come down to who can be insured to be in your space. If you have lots of groups in there and somebody's stuff is nicked or somebody gets hurt, who's responsible? And sadly, what I've found in, in Ireland so far is that that question shuts everything down. Um, and we, you know, there's a reason why Smart Lab, we had to just reopen a, a studio in London to carry on doing the work we were doing before because we haven't been able to make it work even with university backing and a lot of industry money. So that's, I think, the level at which we need to tackle it as a community and figure out that insurance model and the community responsibility model. And then we have the vocabulary and we have the working practice. You know, we can show lots of good practice examples, but there seem to be legislative differences here that um, aren't obvious, but that you run up against after you invest a lot of time in something. And maybe we need to just club together as communities who want to share these spaces and figure it out together. <laughs> And uh, I'm actually trying to make a, generate a roadmap for communities uh, to get through institutions 
so that institutions can actually support that. So I'm just wondering from the first two speakers whether the things you're developing can be collaborated with. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I want to speak. Uh, sure. Uh, so, I mean, every, uh, every uh, for the Community Planet game, which is a game for urban planning, uh, it's always facilitated by some person who is a decision maker. Now, maybe the game is um, being done by um, a community or a CDC, and the process is them actually creating a visioning plan, and they submit to the government or the city. Um, but oftentimes, it's city institutions or even university institutions, and it's very tough to have buy-in both for the institution to do something experimental, but also the trust between the institution and the public. And so in one way, you know, like bringing everybody together on this, uh, into the same process, both institutional and citizen, um, it's been off and on both a trust building exercise and also a will tolerate you exercise. Um, and then just to, to end with, uh, uh, most of the, the people who come to us from uh, large institutions, government, uh, NGO, whatever, are middle manager type of people. People who perhaps aren't, haven't been beaten down cynically <laughs> by the institution yet, uh, so they still have some, you know, uh, passion toward it. Um, but they also do, they don't have the they don't have the position of power to, you know, make, make the process perhaps as successful as possible. So it's a very laborious process. And usually at the end, the top people like get have some buy-in and they take credit for it. But at the beginning, it's very much a struggle. Mm -hmm. And I would just say absolutely everything Smart Lab does. It's a Smart Lab stands for Site Specific Media Arts Lab. So it's a it's a it's a physical space and a virtual space around the world now where um, artists, technologists, medical doctors, educators, planners um, can work together to solve real social needs in education, in, in uh, assistive technology, in, in all kinds of spaces. Um, so it is it is effectively a collaboratory, both real and virtual. Um, and our aim now, our, our new aim for this year, after coming back from Brussels yesterday, and they want to set up lots of smart labs all over Europe and Africa and the Middle East, and I was saying, great, why don't we have one in Dublin yet? Let's actually have a space for people in Dublin. Why don't we do that? <laughs> so that's our challenge. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know, we're talking about this need to have your leaving cert or whatever gets you into third level. But then we're also seeing open education and MOOCs and people questioning in the US the cost of education. Is it actually worth getting into debt you know, until your PhD is done to go to third level education? Any comments about that? Don't get me started. Well, I'd <laughs> 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 just add a few stories night. about that. As in, <laughs> it seems all the big colleges in America have the course fees that big because they have to pay for all the advertising to get all the people through the course colleges in the first place. <laughs> so it's a nice vicious circle that just keeps feeding itself. I'm sure someone's making the money somewhere in between. <laughs> Don't know who, but um, no, I like the idea of MOOCs, I like the idea of open courses. I know some MOOCs you can kind of go into and you can actually then pay for the accreditation after the fact, but you can still do them. I think it's good that you can get in there and I think it's good. A lot of colleges see it as a way of promoting themselves as well not just the students, but around the world now, globally. Yeah, exactly. So I think, it, I think it's a very good idea, and it's, it's just good because if you're not sure of something, you can go in and if the course is running or if it's about to run, you can find out some information. You don't have to do the course. I've not done about 100 courses so far, and I found each one very enjoyable. 